<laughs> Let's pray and we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you love us so much. And Father, as we study your word that you have supplied to us, that you have preserved throughout the years, we pray that you would open it up to us. Lord, help us to understand your word and help us to put it into practice. We want to be doers of your word, not hearers only. So, Lord, this morning we'll hear your word. And I pray that we'd be faithful to put it into practice. And I pray that in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Colossians. It's a small, one of the smaller epistles, but it's one of the most Christ-centered books of the Bible. In this epistle, this short letter, Paul stresses the supremacy of the person of Christ and the completeness of the salvation that he provides. And he does this because he wants to combat this growing heresy in the church that was there in Colossae. Now, in order to fight that, Paul will make it clear in this letter that there is no reason for speculation. There's no reason for mystical visions. And there is no need for ritualism. And that is because faith in Christ is sufficient. In Christ, there is no need for all these ritualistic regulations that eventually devolve into, her, into heresy or heretical doctrines. Now, Colossians, uh, Ephesians, uh, Philemon, of course, uh, uh, Philippians, if I believe out Philippians, they were likely written about the same time. Now, at that time, Paul was imprisoned under Rome, and this was his first imprisonment. And this places the date of this letter somewhere between 60 and 63 A.D., about the time my wife was born. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Today's her birthday. I, I, I've got to make fun of her for that. She's only a couple of years older than me. <laughs> She's not. I'm older than her. Many of the themes between those letters, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Philemon, many of the themes overlap. Uh, themes like the centrality of Christ, um, having the proper mindset, the church body as the body of Christ, or, or unity in the body of Christ, being in union within the body, and also submission to Christ. Now, like the letter to the Ephesians, it wasn't delivered, and Philippians as well, it wasn't delivered personally by Paul. He was, he was preoccupied. He was imprisoned, right? He, he <laughs> was in the middle of being imprisoned. So uh, he had this letter to the Colossians delivered uh, by Tychicus, and this also converted slave whose name was Onesimus. Now, Paul would also write a letter to Philemon in which he requested mercifully that that Philemon received back Onesimus who was a runaway slave now notice that Philemon is he's not in the letter to the Colossians see if Philemon comes after this letter to the Colossians um, actually quite a bit after 
this letter to the Colossians, which is interesting because you would think that you would have, you know, the letters in in a sequential kind of order um, according to the date that they were written, but that's not how we have it in the New Testament. Um, after Colossians, we have 1 Thessalonians. But 1 Thessalonians is really the second letter, or the second epistle that Paul wrote. He first wrote Galatians, and then he wrote 1 Thessalonians, and that would have been sometime around 51 A.D. Now, what's going on here is that when the Bible was assembled in printed form, the New Testament was ordered according to binding practices of that day. And what they would do is they would assemble books together from the largest to the smallest of the books in order of author. Now, keep in mind that that is not going by by number of chapters. You know, the... The fact that one book might have five chapters and another book four chapters does not mean that one book is longer than the other. You know, some chapters are shorter than other chapters. Um, it's more by word count according to the language. So you'll notice that after the four Gospels, we have the longest book, which is Acts. That's written by Luke. And after that, we have Romans and then Galatians down to the shortest of Paul's epistles, Philemon. Then we have Hebrews, and we don't know who wrote Hebrews. I feel like I know who wrote Hebrews. I feel like it was Paul that wrote Hebrews. Um, and when we get in, into Hebrews and we study it, um, and, and I'll bring up when we get there the possibilities of who could have written that book, but I think we'll come to the conclusion that it was most likely Paul. Um, but the author is not named in that book. So technically, we really don't know who wrote it. Now, of course, uh, then at the end of the New Testament, we have Revelation. And it just makes sense that Revelation would be at the end of the New Testament as it deals with the wrapping up of all these things, the fulfillment of all these things. Now, Paul wrote four books while he was in prison in Rome. And again, those were Ephesians. Those were Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And Paul had planted the church in Ephesus as well as the church in Philippi. But he had not planted the church that was in Colossae. Now, Colossae is located in Asia Minor. It's to the east of Laodicea. And the population of Colossae was around 5,000 at this time, making it more well less of a city of more of a village at one time Colossae had been a prosperous city but it had once uh it once while it was famous uh, for for its uh, dyed fabrics and things like that it had uh degenerated it wasn't the city that it once was it was now just mostly a village um so while Paul was in prison he learned that a man named Epaphras who had lived in Colossae, had raised up a church. Now, this was a man that Paul had led to Christ while, he was, while Paul was in Ephesus. And as Paul taught there in the lecture hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus, he taught there for two years. In fact, Acts 19.10 10 says of that time that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. It would not be surprising that some people from Colossae heard the gospel taught by Paul at that time and had been converted and then gone back home and shared the gospel there. The church in Colossae was meeting in the home of Philemon. Now we can kind of connect the dots here and see how all of this is related. Epaphras was quite productive. He planted churches not only in there in Colossae, but also in Laodicea. Yes, that's the church that's mentioned in the book of Revelation. And also in another place called Hierapolis. 
Now, it's even possible that Epaphras is the same man as Epaphroditus, whom we saw in the book of Philippians. And that would mean that Epaphras was pastoring multiple churches. Lord bless him. The people of Colossae, they primarily raised sheep or goats. The village was relatively poor considering what was around them. Um, nine miles away was the soon-to-become wealthy city of Laodicea, which, again, that's the book that's mentioned in Revelation, or that's the city that's mentioned in the book of Revelation. Nine miles to the north of Colossae was Heropolis, and about 100 miles to the west was Ephesus. These places were all more, much more significant than Colossae. In fact, Colossae was the least important city to receive a letter from Paul. However, Colossae was not too out of the way or too insignificant for God. God had something he wanted to say to them. God was watching over his people. We need to understand here that there is no one that is unimportant to God. Not a single one of us is unimportant to God. We may feel like we are. We may feel like, well, I, I, I'm not a great glory. I'm not a, a Billy Graham or a Franklin Graham. I'm not even a whatever, whatever the case may be. And yet, you are important to God. My friend, don't be discouraged. Don't grow discouraged. You may not, be, may not feel like you're important at all in this world. But understand that you have been saved from this world. And you're important to God. So important that He died for your sins. Every single one of our sins He died for. Paul had never been to the church there in Colossae. He found out from about this church from Epaphras. He also discovered that there was this heresy that was threatening the Colossian church. The Colossian church was primarily Gentile, by the way. Now, there were some there who were of the opinion that Christ Jesus alone was not sufficient for salvation. So they questioned the divinity of Jesus Christ and they question the gospel. They felt there should be some additional additions to it. And, and those additions were beginning to sound like Gnosticism. Their heresy was a mix of this Greek speculation, Jewish legalism, Asian mysticism. It was a mix of uh, religious self-discipline, Worship of angels, his intercessors, and mystical experiences. And it also incorporated circumcision, uh, dietary regulations, and ritual observations. It, it's a mix that we could kind of lump together into this idea of Gnosticism or, or knowledge um, an exaltation of, of man's knowledge really above faith. I guess that's maybe the easiest way to put it. The false teaching was that it was coming into the church promising a closer union with God. 
it, it said that there could be a more perfect spirituality than what the gospel alone, as the apostles was teaching it, could achieve for you. If they would accept and observe all these additions to the gospel, then they could have a more full depth of knowledge. Now, there were also those in the church like Philemon and Epaphras who wanted to preserve the gospel as it was. That was because all of this additional stuff was nothing more than man-made philosophy and tradition being elevated above truth. Why complicate with tradition and philosophy what God has made simple? In our world today, there's a fight going on, which is, is, you know, that fight is which is more important, intellect or faith? Especially amongst Christians, these two ideas fight for preeminence. Some think that the two are just mutually exclusive. You either have to blind faith or you have uh, intellect. But you can't have faith and intellect. And others say that our minds are more important. And our faith has to proceed then from our understanding. And if the two contradict, then the mind has to uh, reign supreme. And this is especially born out of hundreds of years of rationalism in, in our Western culture. If we cannot understand and explain something, then it must not be true. Now, I'm not going to argue for any of these points. In fact, I firmly believe that faith has to precede understanding. I believe that our goal should be to know Christ's mind and not our own. And increasing in maturity as a Christian doesn't mean that we get smarter. It means that we think more like Jesus. Now, does that mean that we just we throw away our minds? Uh, of course not. But we don't elevate the mind above our faith. Instead, our faith has to precede our ability to understand something completely. There are, there are simply things that we will not understand because God is too complicated for us. Isaiah 55, 8 through 11 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please." And it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. Believing in the truth of what God said will come before understanding the mind of God. 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So why say all of this? Because the book of Colossians is all about which is more important, the mind or faith. The book of Colossians is about simplicity in believing God. At the time that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae, he would have been around 30 years in Christ. And this letter that he wrote is completely centered on Christ. So let's dig in with verse 1. And it says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints 
and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Paul had never actually been to Colossae. But it sure is nice when word of our faith and love gets passed on to others. The Christians of Colossae, they knew who Paul was. They would have been familiar with his story. They would have been familiar with his work. And seeing that the Apostle Paul was the author of this letter, the Colossian Christians would have recognized the weight behind this letter. Now, the Greek word, apostolos, it means one who is sent. At the deepest level, it means one who speaks on behalf of God. So, an apostle or an apostolos is one who is commissioned and empowered to act as God's representative. From the text, we know that Timothy was also with Paul, probably acting as a scribe. Now, perhaps the Colossian Christians, perhaps they were familiar with Timothy as well. Look at verse 2. When Paul addressed the saints, he didn't separate from he didn't separate this group of Christians from another group of Christians. He said, saints. Every true Christian is a saint. But Paul does make a distinction within the Colossian church. Saints and faithful brethren. By faithful brethren, Paul may refer to those who had not embraced the false teaching that was coming into that church. Now, look at the second half of verse 2, and there it says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's greeting would have been a familiar one. It was a greeting that he used a lot. But it's absolutely heartfelt. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's unconditional goodwill toward people. It is unquestionably expressed in the saving work of Jesus Christ. This letter that is full of love and concern that is written to church to the to a church that Paul had never planted or visited, it shows us the power of Christian love. Paul didn't need to see or to meet or directly know these Christians in order to love them and be concerned for them. And I think maybe it's appropriate to say here that we need to be very careful of how we deal with one another. In this day and age, especially online. One thing that social media today has done is, is, well, for one thing, it's given a voice to people who had not had a voice before. Secondly, it's emboldened us, emboldened us to say things that we would not say face to face. And thirdly, It opens doors that never would have been opened before. Many of the things that get posted are things that we would never actually say to anyone. We would never reveal to anyone. And, and we put them on Facebook as if nobody reads them. And then we react when somebody responds to them. We react as if, how dare you <laughs> respond to what I put on there?
And what's interesting is that, and this is, maybe this is just for somebody who pastors a church, is that a lot of times the people that, that you know friended you because they're in the Christian community. You know, you don't, maybe, you know, I, I don't know them. I, I, it's not somebody that, that I, I would hang out with because I, I've never been, you know, face-to-face friends with. Just somebody who knows of me or, or I know of them or whatever the case may be. But the implication is that, hey, they're a Christian brother or sister. They're a brother or sister in the Lord. And then you look and see what they post. And it's like, whoa. I mean, some, I see some stuff that's posted online by Christians, and perhaps wrongly, I, I think, are they really a Christian? And so this section of the Scripture, actually, it... it, it causes me to reconsider because Paul here, knowing that some of the Colossian Christians were dabbling in these heretical teachings, at the same time he calls them saints. He didn't know any of them, but he chose to deal with them from this place of love. You know, the world is divided. Our, our nation is as divided as it has ever been. And we probably would expect that. But for Christians and the church to be divided over things that are clearly spelled out in Scripture is just terrible. And for the church to be divided over issues that have nothing to do with anything except a worldly kingdom rather than our heavenly citizenship, that's even worse. So let's commit ourselves to doing what Paul did. You know, in verse 3, Paul said that he prayed for them and gave thanks to God for them. What about, what if, when we were looking through Facebook at the things that our Facebook friends posted and saw that political comment that we absolutely vehemently disagree with, what if instead of posting something back that was stern or shocking, what if we said instead, I love you and I'm praying for you? I thank God for you. Paul, in verse 4, commends the Colossian Christians for their love for all the saints. Do we truly understand the attitude behind somebody's post on Facebook? I don't know about you, but I've received some emails before that I've read an attitude into. (laughs) And I was completely wrong about the attitude behind them. Of course, didn't discover that until I responded back. (laughs) And they responded back going, what's your deal, man? (laughs) I thought they were being harsh with me. I was harsh right back at them. And then discovered they weren't being harsh with me. That wasn't the attitude they had when they wrote it to me. I just read it into it. And, oh. How about instead of responding on Facebook, what if we actually picked up the phone and called somebody? Or what if we actually asked them to meet us somewhere and and have lunch? A face-to-face conversation? I wonder where this nation today would be if there was no Facebook. It wouldn't be as divided as it is, certainly. 
Because there is no way that the things that I read on Facebook, there is no way that we would say those things face to face. You know, in John 17, Jesus prayed for believers and he said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, and that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, Even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. We didn't do the song this morning, but we've done it before. And the words to that song are, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. So I have to wonder, when we post many of the things that we do on Facebook, how do they know we are Christians? Because a, lo- a lot of what I read isn't love. Verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in you in heaven, and of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. You know, Paul mentions three important things, faith, love, and hope. Paul was thankful for their faith in Jesus, for their love for all the saints. Genuine faith in Jesus will always have a true love for God's people as a companion. Paul was also also thankful for the hope laid up for them in heaven. He was thankful when he considered the destiny of the Colossian Christians. You know, their eternal destiny was affected by the truth of the gospel, and the truth of the gospel was bringing forth fruit. Christians recognized that it wasn't only Paul who had a responsibility to share the gospel, but even while he was in prison, the gospel was still going out into the Roman Empire or the known world at that time. Now, notice that Paul mentions faith, love, and hope, and not knowledge. Our problem, much of our problem today, is that we put a premium on our ability to understand and comprehend, yet we don't truly understand and comprehend. We discount God instead of discounting our intellect. Faith and love spring from hope, and and that originates with the word of the truth of the gospel. Faith and love do not spring from the intellect. Now notice how the hope has two components. Stored up in heaven and you have heard before 
and the word of the truth of the gospel. Why bother becoming a follower of Jesus if this life is all that there is? For the most part, it's a pretty sorry existence. And we're surrounded by sin and temptation, and, and everything around us is just a result of the fall. I mean, I don't want to, myself, maybe you guys are different, but I, I, I don't want to live forever in this kind of circumstance. But we have a huge hope that heaven awaits us where there will be no more sorrow or sin. There will be only joy. And the biblical definition is, of hope is not the way that the world defines it. You know, the world defines hope as being wishful thinking. I hope my phone won't explode in my pocket. But the biblical definition of hope is confident expectation. There, there's a lot more to heaven than we know about. You know, Jesus talked more about hell than he actually did about heaven. But trust me, heaven's going to be great. Of more importance to the text before us is that the source of the hope is not uh, some human-generated emotion or, or human-created philosophy. That's the trap of, of intellectualism or Gnosticism, that our minds will determine our future. It's the sort of universal, universalistic idea that man will eventually rise above petty differences because of intellectualism. And then, so we'll get along together. So on the one hand, we have the promise of man, and I, I don't know about you, but I have noticed that the promises of man very rarely pan out. And on the other hand, we have the promise of God, creator of the universe. And I have noticed that the promises of God always seem to pan out. The gospel is true. We just have to decide whether we're going to believe it or not. Now, look at the second half of verse 6. It says, as it, also, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Once we believe the gospel, that is when we start bearing fruit and growing, our problem is that we have it, often we have it backwards. We have intellect challenging faith instead of faith informing intellect. We have a hard time understanding grace. And, and at least in, in part of this, in part this, this causes us to rely on our intellect over our faith. You know, our flesh desires works. But grace is God's gift to us. It's not something that we can earn. And this sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Gnosticism, uh, today pluralism, you know, it teaches us that we can take a little from every religion, kind of put it together, melt it together into a, a casserole, and put it all in the same plate. You know, we could call it potluck religion. You know, when you go to a potluck and, and you don't know the people who cook the food, it can be a fairly risky proposition. And, and often potlucks are where good eating habits go to die, right? <laughs> In other words, potluck religion is not very nutritious, nor does it really satisfy when you really need it to. And like most potlucks, Gnosticism or pluralism are heavy on desserts, but there's no fruit. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me in John 14.6. Mm. 
In verse 7, Paul continues and he says, As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. This is where, where Paul first brings up Epaphras. Now, Epaphras was probably visiting Paul in prison for a few reasons. First, to inform Paul of the young churches that had been started in Colossae, Laodicea, and uh, Heropolis. Also, there were heretical teachings, which we spoke about earlier, in the Colossian church. And, and this is a big if, it's possible that Epaphras is the same person that we read about in Philippians, Epaphroditus. And if that's the case, then he was also there to minister to Paul while Paul was in prison. Now, verse 9 continues, and it says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, notice that it says the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And here I say, don't pray for smarts. Pray for knowledge of God's will through the Spirit. But why? Well, to know God and what He requires of us is a responsibility. In fact, it's our first responsibility. As we read through this epistle, we will find that Paul frequently alludes to knowledge and wisdom. And he hates the idea that the church was deficient in those things, and he prays for them in in these areas. Spiritual ignorance is a constant source of error. It's a source of instability. It's a source of sorrow. So then Paul and Epaphras desired that that the church in Colossae, as well as, as all Christians, because these letters were written for all of us, might be soundly taught in the things of God. Verse 10 continues. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and longsuffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Bless you. Our second responsibility is living out a walk that is worthy of the Lord. And this is something that's repeated over and over again in the New Testament. Our walk is based on our knowledge of God and our understanding of His will. And being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God is how we can be fully pleasing to God and how we can have a worthy walk. Of course, we're not in Christ if we just can't please God. Remember that Paul is writing to Christians. Jesus said in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what your what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. We're prone to take that phrase fruitful in every good work from from our verses here and then try to make something complicated out of it. You know, maybe we look at, at uh, what the Franklin Grahams or the Greg Lorries of the world do, and we think, well, I can't do that. Spurgeon, I like how Spurgeon puts this. He says, have you the ability to preach the gospel? Preach it. Does a little child need comforting? Comfort him. 
Can you stand up and vindicate a glorious truth before thousands? Do it. Does a poor saint need a bit of dinner from your table? Send it to her. Let works of obedience, testimony, zeal, charity, piety, and philanthropy all be found in your life. Do not select big things as your special line, but glorify the Lord also in the littles. You know, life is not about how smart you get. It's about how your life mirrors that of Jesus Christ and how he works through you bearing fruit. That's the way to know God more. The more you give him access to your life and the more that you respond to his gentle and sometimes not so gentle prods, the more you know him, the more you learn his heart of compassion and his heart of sacrifice. We're, we're prone to think that the things that we do just don't qualify. We look at the crusades that are going on and we see hundreds going forward to receive Jesus Christ and then we disqualify the fact that we went up to a friend and hugged them to show them compassion when they're going through something. But it's the Father who qualifies us. It's not our works. Verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Paul says that we have been delivered from the power of darkness. You know, Back in Luke 22, Jesus spoke in the same terms about His own arrest and crucifixion. You know, today we observe the power of darkness because of its effects. We observe the power of darkness in blinding of people to the truth. We observe it in the concealment of truth or, or deception. We observe it in affliction of the children of God. We observe it in, in the fascination of the world with dark things. We observe it in the emboldening of wicked men to come against God. As Christians, we are free from the power of darkness. And if y'all let me quote Spurgeon again, he said, We still are tempted by Satan, but we are not under his power. We have to fight with him, but we are not his slaves. He is not our king. He has no rights over us. We do not obey him. We will not listen to his temptations. Nevertheless, the power of darkness can influence us. Now, sometimes the opposition to the truth is so pervasive and powerful that you can feel like just giving up. And maybe it's someone at work, or maybe it's a, a professor or a teacher in school. Maybe it's your friends. But remember what verse 11 said. God will give you patience and endurance. Patience is the ability to stand up against opposition no matter what. That's why it's also known as long-suffering. God is long-suffering towards us. <laughs> Endurance is the ability to continue on to a goal regardless of the circumstances. 
God has rescued us. That means that we can give thanks with joy. We've been fully rescued. Conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love is what it says in verse 13. Son of His love is a, just a messianic phrase referring to the Messiah, the Son of God. It means that everything we have and everything we are now, it belongs to Christ. And the price for our release was paid by the blood of Christ, by the blood of Jesus. And when we are in spiritual warfare with the powers of darkness, we can plead the blood of Christ. I mean, not, not in a magical or superstitious kind of uh, sense. But the blood of Christ, it shows the receipt of our lawful purchase as redeemed people. Our sin and guilt has been sent away because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Satan has no claim on us. We are no longer under the judgment that this world that we live in is under. And so we don't have to live the way the world lives. We don't have to live like those who are under the judgment of God. Paul's going to start getting into some of the heresies that were being dealt with here, or that he's going to deal with here in the Colossian church in a second. We probably won't get there today, but verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having, been ma having made peace through the blood of his cross. You know, most scholars will tell you that these verses were actually from a hymn that was sung in the early church. And it, it was a hymn that described what Christians believed about Jesus. You wouldn't hear anything like this if you turned on radio today. I, mean, I just read it to you. It doesn't have a good beat. Can't dance to it. WBFJ would not play this. Or WDJC, whichever the... I can't remember which one was North Carolina and which one is here. I always get them confused. But this is this is the doctrine of the church. And yet we can go to churches today. and have a hard time finding this actually proclaimed. In fact, in some of the churches today, I don't see how they could even study this book without skipping over those verses because they would have a hard time explaining what they taught the week before. First, Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The Greek word for image that Paul uses here means both likeness and manifestation. It 
Next, it names Jesus as the firstborn over all creation. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus is less than God. In fact, the ancient rabbis called Yahweh himself firstborn of the world. Firstborn was also a messianic title and expresses priority, expresses privileges. He is the author over all creation. He himself is not a created being. When we behold the wonder and the glory of the world that Jesus created, we worship him and we honor him all the more. We need look no further than our own children's ministry here to observe the miracle of creation and the power of God. You know, a single human chromosome contains 20 billion bits of information. If it was written in regular books, if it was written down and recorded in regular books like, like we would have here, bound together, it'd be about 4,000 volumes. And that's not in a font that you or I could read. And we can look to the earth, we can look at the heavens, and we can see the incredible works of God. They are way far beyond anything that man can do. And and to try to attribute any of them to chance is just a display of ignorance. You know, some of the the simplest things that we try and attribute to chance have nothing to do with chance. Flip a coin, heads or tails, has nothing to do with chance. There's no chance involved. Instead, it's in the way that you flip the coin, the atmospheric atmospheric, uh, conditions when you flip the coin, the type of coin, has nothing to do with chance. <clears throat> Next, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And by the way, as long as you're talking about chance. If anyone can point out anything that exists in this world that was constructed by chance, I'll I'll go in debt and I'll give you a million (laughs) dollars. You will not find anything. There is nothing in this world that was constructed by chance. Nothing. This building had a builder. The watch that I'm wearing was put together by someone. This world was constructed. It was built. It was created. You know, and these things, all these things... This, uh, Created through him, created for him. This is a Christ centric universe. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Jesus existed prior to creation, before all things, all existence of every kind. He unifies and sustains all creation. He holds all things together. He is the preserver. Hebrews 1 speaks of Christ saying, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. That is an amazing statement. It means that Jesus is the one who is keeping things going right now. And you know this is something we can forget very easily. We, we get so used to seeing things through the secular eyes of the media or, or Facebook 
You know, it, we forget that behind the events of the world, there is a mighty controlling hand. He brings them all together. He brings all things together. He permits some things to happen. He restrains other things. But it's he that is ultimately in control. And in this crazy, is the polite word, election season, <laughs> remember, the Bible tells us a mighty hand is shaping the destiny of the nations and of individuals. All of these things have been and will always remain in the power of him who sustains the universe by the word of his power. Now moving on, he is the head of the body, he is the head of the church. And this describes Jesus' relationship with the church as we have Seen already from previous studies, Jesus is head of the church regarding order of authority. But here, the Greek word for head refers to Jesus' role as source of the church. It's kind of the way that we might refer to the head of, of a river. And so the designation that Christ is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead... See, the firstborn from the dead speaks to his resurrection to a glorified body which precedes our own bodily resurrection. Now finally, Paul ends this section saying that in all things he may have the preeminence. This is how Paul chose to wrap up this part. Jesus is preeminent. This is Paul's summarization of what he has just said. Jesus is preeminent. The word preeminence is the Greek word proteo. It, it means to be first in rank or influence. It comes from another Greek word that means foremost in time or foremost in order and importance. And we kind of see this in the English word prototype, uh, which is the first model or first type of something. It's therefore the idea of being first. In, in that sense, holding the number one position in the order of things. So here preeminence simply means that Christ, as the head of the church, should be held in the highest esteem in our lives. His position in our life should be exalted. Our lives should demonstrate appreciation for His supreme position in the universe. In the whole priority structure of our lives and everything in our lives, He should occupy that first place. He is the preeminent one. In Psalm 8, we read that God set the stars into the universe with his fingers. But when speaking of Christ's work of redemption, the prophet Isaiah said, To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My point is this, creating the stars may have been an incredible, mighty miracle, but even greater was overcoming death in order to redeem us from our sin. Now given this, let's be certain to acknowledge in our lives the preeminence of Christ. So today, in light of this, Consider, do you acknowledge Christ's preeminence? Do you give him first place in all you do and all you think? Is his character what people see when they look at you? 
You know, preeminence doesn't mean once a week on Sunday. It means every day 